Welcome back, everyone. This is part two of lecture 15. So now we want to solve the exact problem that we saw in part one. That is, uh, we want to design a compensator so that the steady state error is less or equal to 0 0.02, and the phase margin has to be greater than 48. So we are working with a plant equals to 50 over S times one plus 0 0.2 S. And we've already seen that by just adding this constant gain, we've met the requirements in terms of steady, st steady state error. Now we only need to meet the requirements in terms of phase margin. So instead of doing it uh, with a phase lead compensator, we're gonna use a phase lag compensator. Now the approach here is a little bit different. So uh, as we saw, when we add to the system a, a, a compensator, a phase compensator, not only are we changing by increasing or decreasing the phase, but we are also changing the gain, especially the high frequency gain. So we can manipulate directly the phase by using a phase lead compensator. But in this case, we cannot really do that because a phase lag compensator removes space. So how can we increase our phase margin by removing phase? Well, that is not the right approach. Um, for this particular design. So the approach should be actually kind of the other way around. We should look at the gain plot. So if we could modify the crossover frequency, we could, if we could shift it to the left, then at that point, the phase, our actual phase is much uh, further from minus 180. So automatically our phase margin would be increased. And in fact, we can already compute the exact frequency at which our ideal phase margin would be or is 48 degrees. So we're actively changing the gain and our side effect is to obtain um, a phase margin, a higher phase margin. Of course, you can still you still have the the drop in terms of phase. But if you can design a compensator such that the the phase drop happens at lower frequencies, for example, over here, then you wouldn't really uh, care about this decrease in phase because that's quite far from your crossover frequency. So that does not determine your phase margin. So again, here the approach is let's shift the crossover frequency to the left. And by doing that, we increase uh, secondarily, the phase margin. So can we actually move the crossover frequency to the left? Yes, we can. And we can do that by bringing the gain plot down. And that's exactly what a, um, a lag compensator does in terms of magnitude. It drops it. If we go back and take a look at our phase lag compensator body plot, let's go back. The overall contribution of a lag compensator sees a decrease in gain, which will in turn shift the crossover frequency 
to the left, we have the opposite effect of what we had for the lead compensator. The lead compensator would shift the crossover frequency to the right. And instead here, we can use the lag compensator to shift the crossover frequency to the left. So let's calculate the ideal place where our crossover frequency would be. So ideally, we would like our actual phase, so the phase of um, G plus 180 to be equal to 48. Or in other words, we want the phase of our system to be equal to minus 132. That would be this point over here. So the phase of the system is our tangent of omega over zero minus our tangent, we've already seen this, of 0 0.2 omega over one, and that it has to be equal to minus 132. So I'm gonna skip a few steps, which you can find in the, um, in the notes. And we find that omega is equal to 4.5 radians per second. So for this value of the frequency, the phase margin would be 48. So if we had a crossover frequency equal to 4.5 radians per second of the uncompensated system, the phase margin would be exactly 48 degrees. Okay, so once again, at 4.5 radians per second, the gain should be zero though, because that would be our ideal crossover frequency. However, at 4.5, the gain is not zero. In fact, it has a positive value here. I've already written its value, but we can find it. And in order to find such value, well, we just take 20 logarithm of the magnitude of our uh, transfer function computed at 4.5. So that is 20 logarithm of 50 over 4.5 times square root of 1 plus 0 0.04 times 4.5. Squared, and that is about 18.3 decibels. And again, we can round it up for safety to about 20 decibels. So this is the amount of decibels that we need to drop the, the, the body plot, the magnitude part of the body plot so that the new crossover frequency is about at 4.5 radians per second. So remember that the amount of decibels that we're dropping um, the, the magnitude body plot of is equal to that 20 logarithm of alpha. So in this case, we have 20 logarithm of alpha is equal to minus 20 or alpha is equal to 10 to the power of minus 0 0.1, which is uh, sorry, not 0 0.1, rather 1. So it is 0 0.1. And being it less than 1 confirms that we're actually looking for a phase lag compensator. So once again, we need a compensator which has this exact same structure. One plus I omega alpha tau over one plus I omega tau. And what do we know here? We know alpha. So if we know alpha, we can 
know exactly the maximum amount of phase that we can remove by using arc sine of alpha minus one over alpha plus one. So that is arc sine of minus 0.9 over 1.1, which is about minus 55 degrees. And that is at the compensator practical limit for what I said earlier. Okay, so now we have alpha, we just need tau. Or in other words, we need to select the position of sigma z and sigma p. It doesn't really matter where sigma z and sigma p are as long as they are to quite to the left of our uh, crossover frequency or where we would like our crossover frequency to be. So we're interested in operating in this area here. So if we can place the sigma z and sigma p at low frequencies, so frequencies that are close to zero, which if you think about it in the root locus, we had exactly the same thing. We had the, the zero and the pole that were very close to uh, the imaginary axis. And the distance from the origin is nothing but omega. So from the S-plane perspective, the distance from the origin is your omega. So here we can um, have an arbitrary step. So we can choose the location of the frequency associated with the zero. And we take um, the largest of the poles magnitude wise of the uncompensated system. So the uncompensated system had frequencies at zero and at five. So we're gonna take the largest five and divide it by 50, which is a similar thing that we saw when we were designing um, the lag compensator in the root locus. And so we five divided by 50 is 0 0.1 radians per second. And so we've arbitrarily picked sigma z. So sigma z is what? Sigma z is one over tau alpha. And so we arbitrarily say, well, kind of arbitrarily, that, ha that has to be equal to 0 0.1 radians per second. Or in other words, tau has to be one over alpha times 0 0.1 or one over 0 0.01, which is 100 seconds. So sigma p being simply one over tau is 0 0.01 radians per second. And of course, tau times alpha is 10. Okay, we have alpha, we have tau, therefore we can find the frequency at which the maximum amount of phase is subtracted, and that is omega m, given by one over square root of alpha times tau, which is 0 0.032 radians per second. And here we have our black compensator in the frequency domain given by one plus 10 i omega over one plus 100 i omega. All right, so here, once again, I've already drawn the compensated um, body plots along with the uncompensated body plots. So you can see what has changed. We've dropped the gain and at high frequency, the drop was 
20 logarithm of it's about 20 logarithm of alpha so that is in this case minus 20 decibels but this drop affects also earlier portions of the body plot and especially this portion over here and that means that we've shifted our crossover frequency towards the left. So our new crossover frequency, you know, we would have to recompute it. Of course, I, now I use MATLAB and I found that that is equal to 3.93 radians per second. When we go to the phase, you see that the, the phase drop happens at very low frequencies because the, the values of the uh, cutoff frequencies for the pole and the zeros were very small. Therefore, the drop in phase happens at very low frequencies. It doesn't really affect um, the values of the frequencies that of interest. So, you know, in this case, about four radians per second. At that point, you see that the value of the compensated phase is not much different from the uncompensated one. So we haven't really changed the phase. However, by shifting the crossover frequency to the left, we've increased the phase margin. And in this very case, the phase margin has increased to 50.3. So now having 50.3, that is greater than 48, which was our requirement. Therefore, um, our design works. So once again, we can solve the very same problem having a plant uh, and we want, which, you know, when uncompensated had a phase margin of 18 at a frequency of 15.42 radians per second, we can design either a lead compensator or a lag compensator to increase the phase. So, with the lead compensator, we saw that the phase margin increased to 48.3 degrees at a crossover frequency that has increased also. In fact, it is 30.9 radians per second. Whereas if we uh, designed a phase lag compensator to increase the phase margin, okay, the phase margin has increased, but now that happens for lower, lower frequencies. And in fact, that happens for a crossover frequency of 3.93 radians per second. So although the requirements that were asked are met, the response of the system, whether we use a lead compensator or a lag compensator changes, especially when we consider the crossover frequency. If we have a higher crossover frequency, then we're gonna have a more responsive system. So, or, you know, with a lower um, rise time. So using a lead compensator will do that. And in fact, I suggest you to uh, plot the response of the system. Uh, you can plot the response to a step unit and see that the response, whether we use a lead compensator or a lag compensator changes quite dramatically. However, uh, the two requirements that were asked are met. And also you can um, plot the, the error as a function of time with respect to uh, ramp input and, and also see how E of T is different, whether we are using a lead compensator or a phase lag compensator. Okay, so these are two uh, very useful, in my opinion, um, examples of a design for uh, the compensators when we are dealing with um, uh, the, the frequency domain. So the design, the, the, the compensators are used a little bit more uh, or in a way that I would say it's completely different from what we use them 
in the root locus uh, context. Um, so to recap, the lead compensator was used to actively increase the phase. So actively increase the phase margin and its side effect was a shift towards higher frequencies for the um, crossover frequency. For the lag compensator, instead, um, we are dropping the magnitude in order to shift the crossover frequency to the left. And as a side effect, we would have an increase of phase margin. The decrease of phase margin associated with the lag compensator does not affect the phase margin because we can um, design the, um, the cutoff frequencies associated with the zero and the pole and therefore with the, their geometric mean omega m um, to, the, to the left. And so the drop in frequency, uh, sorry, in uh, phase does not affect the phase margin. All right, so this is all and I'll see you next time. Take care.